Good evening, friends. Well, it's Friday once again, and I'm back with another tale from my collection. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with me. Tell me what you think in the comments, and I'll be sure to join the conversation. Now it's time to grab a snack, dim the lights, and let me take you into the night with a story I call Mermaids. Roaring thunder seemed to roll in time to the waves of the storm. Each crack of lightning sounded on the hull like a giant hammer slamming the steel. It was as if Triton himself was trying to break the ship. James cringed at each cracking blow but tried not to show his fear to the others seated in the galley with him. Across the table, their oldest crew member, Ben, seemed unfazed by the storm as he steadily shoveled fried meat and potatoes into his face. The other men appeared cautious but not unduly concerned as they too took advantage of the chance for a meal. Unlike James, the rest of the crew had weathered many storms at sea. The oncoming storm had put an end to the work on the deck when the captain instructed the men to batten down the hatches and get something to eat before rough seas made that impossible. According to the weather charts, they were in for a serious blow which would carry on for at least the next 12 hours. They had been busily preparing and repairing equipment for their next job, salvaging a derelict ship that had run aground and sunk in a small cluster of islands. It was a heavy workship laden with equipment and cranes, which, if pieced out and sold individually, were worth more than twice what the vessel cost. Insurance had paid the claim, leaving the ship to the sea. Now James' ship, the Pathfinder, was racing to beat others to make their claim on the ship. As such, they would not be deterred by a storm. He forced himself to eat while trying to allay his fears of the storm. Yes, the ship was rolling a lot in the heavy seas and he could hear the waves breaking on the decks above, but he had faith in his captain and crew. Surely they would not risk unnecessary danger just for money, would they? Looking to the porthole, he watched as the ship rolled and the window dipped beneath the black water. It looked so calm under the waves. What's the matter, boy? Ben asked. Don't you like the chow? James realized he was eating very slowly compared to the other men. Yeah, it's great. I'm just taking my time and enjoying it. No telling when I'll get to eat again with this storm. His comment caused the other men to burst out in laughter. He wondered what was so funny. Everyone knew the cook couldn't prepare meals if the ship was tossing too violently. And how could they know when the storm would abate? Don't worry about your next meal, boy, Ben said dryly. Eat up and fill your belly. A sailor sleeps better with a full belly, and when the sun comes up, we'll be back here filling up on bacon, eggs, and flapjacks. Mark my words, this little blow will tuck tail and run at the first sight of light, and you'll wake to a calm sea. Here, here, said one of the others, as he loaded his plate again from the pan in the center of the table. James smiled at the prospect of a sunny morning in calm seas. Ignoring the storm outside, he settled into the meal and began to eat in earnest. Surely old Ben knew what he was talking about, and even if he was just blowing smoke, he was right. He always slept better with a full belly. Before long, the pans on the table were empty and their plates were clean as each man sat back to enjoy his coffee and smoke. James listened as they began to talk of other storms they had weathered which made this one seem like a pleasant afternoon shower in the garden. One of the men spoke of riding 200-foot waves, and James tried to conceive of a wave that large. The ship was roughly 200 foot long, and he had looked from stem to stern on a number of occasions. He tried to imagine looking up to see a wave towering above the deck as far as the ship was long, and just could not fathom it. A wave even half that size coming down on this ship would break it in half, sending it to the bottom of the ocean. He was sure they must have been exaggerating to make themselves feel better. One of the men spoke up about something he had seen during a particularly bad storm off the Horn of South America. The ship had been fighting large waves rolling over the bow as it plunged through them for several hours, when all of a sudden it plunged through one and seemed to hang in the air for a long moment. Everything became still for a brief eternity, and then the ship fell. Just like an airplane hitting a downdraft, it fell for what seemed forever before slamming onto the water. The engines revved as the propellers sprung free until they were in the water again and the ship shuddered as it lurched forward on what seemed to be a calm sea. 
The crewman telling the tale had been on watch on the bridge at the time, and he said the lights on the forward tower showed only a calmly rolling seas ahead of the ship that continued into the blackness. Then lightning flashed, and he saw what looked to be a giant dinosaur standing in the water ahead of the ship. It was so large that it blocked the storm like a mountain, and he could still see the storm raging off to the sides of the ship when the lightning lit up the night. Then it was gone as fast as it appeared, and the waves began coming over the bow once again. Sounds like somebody had a double ration of rum before he went on duty, Ben laughed and poured himself more coffee. I've seen some pretty fantastic things at sea, but I ain't never seen no dinosaurs. The others laughed along with him as the crewman sat back grinning and nodding his head as if to say he appreciated the joke and didn't care if they believed him. James looked around the table as the laughter settled down, waiting for someone else to speak. When they didn't, he quietly asked, have you ever seen a mermaid? The men looked at each other and then back at James. A couple of them laughed a little, but not like they had before. This seemed a little more uncomfortable and he wondered if it was because they thought he was crazy or because they did know of mermaids. He waited to see if anyone would answer his question. From behind, the deep voice of the captain rumbled to him. And what do you know of mermaids, young James? James turned to see the captain standing behind him and watched as he slid into the booth next to him, grabbing a coffee cup. Not much, sir, James replied. Sirens were strange creatures which had the lower body of a bird and the upper body of a woman. They would sing their songs to lure sailors to their deaths. Then the gods decreed a contest between the muses and the sirens, which the sirens lost. The muses plucked the feathers from the sirens as trophies, leaving them unable to fly. As such, the siren's lower half transformed to a fishtail, and they became mermaids. The males were known as mermen, and it was thought by some that mermen were actually men who had become enchanted by mermaids and changed in order to become breeding partners. Thus women see them as enemies. Others say that mermaids did not enchant men until after all the mermen were destroyed. Viking legends tell of how they fought hard to extinguish the roving bands of mermaids that fed upon the flesh of men, as they had done as sirens. After many years of searching out and destroying these vile creatures, they thought they had killed them all. But a small band of females escaped this persecution and lived among the islands of the world in small groups. They knew they could never return to the ways of old, and it was forbidden to feast on the flesh of men, lest they be hunted again. With only females remaining of their race, they knew they would need human men to breed and continue their race. So they worked to keep themselves beautiful and change their songs to make themselves desirable. So, in this, mermaids are thought to be gentle creatures and keepers of the sea, rescuing sailors who fall overboard while luring some to live with them. It's said that rejecting the advances of a mermaid would bring misfortune to a man and injuring one would cause a period of misfortune to the responsible crew or coast. Well, it seems you studied the mermaids, young James, the captain smiled. I've heard tell of a place near East Cornwall called Doom Bar, a sandbar that caused shipwrecks that was formed as a result of a mermaid being shot while swimming in the harbor there. And on the Isle of Man in England, it's believed the constant fog is a result of a mermaid who was rejected. Aye, Captain. One of the crew members spoke up. In Outer Everdees, Scotland, about 1830, a mermaid was seen, which sank under the water after being hit by a rock. It was a wee one, a very young lass that washed ashore in the following days and was buried. James spoke up. Sandwood in southern United Kingdom was once known as the land of mermaids because of the number of sightings. There are a lot of stories, but I've never seen a mermaid and don't know any man who has. That's why I ask. I've seen one, Ben spoke up. His tone seemed harsh as if the idea of mermaids put a bad taste in his mouth. A nasty bunch, the lot of them. You'd be well advised, young master, to steer clear if you ever see one. James started to inquire further of Ben, but the old man stood up. With your permission, Captain, he raised his hand in salute. I'd like to climb in my rack now if that's okay. Very well, the captain said. Good night, Ben. 
The men said goodnight to Ben, and some of them excused themselves to follow suit, leaving only James, the captain, and several others. The remaining men were playing cards. James slid a little further around the booth and poured himself another cup of coffee. He was lost in thought about what had been said of mermaids. He wondered what had happened to Ben that made him say the things he had, but held out no hope of finding out as the old man seemed to dislike the subject. He finished his coffee, excused himself, and went to find his rack. He fell asleep as soon as his head hit the pillow, not even aware that the storm had actually gotten worse. Feeling himself falling, James woke with a start as he slammed into the bulkhead. The ship was heaving violently and it was dark in the crew quarters. Somewhere in the distance, he could hear men shouting and the sound of the ship's bell clanging loudly. He scrambled to find his boots and pull them on. Then grabbing his jacket, he felt his way through the darkness to the hatch as he pulled it on and went to see what was happening. Pulling the hatch open, he was immediately hit in the face with a spray of water. His seaman training took over and he instinctively turned to dog the hatch behind him to seal off the compartment. More water sprayed him and he looked up to see a ragged tear in the deck above him where waves were crashing over the deck. He followed the sounds of the other men's voices and found several of the crew working furiously to weld metal plates over a torn seam in the hull. One of the men was struggling to hold a plate in place while another welded and he rushed over to assist. The metal was cold and wet. What happened? he asked, turning his face away from the bright welding arc. Rogue Wave hit the ship from the side and bent her like a bow, the man said. When she straightened back, the seam tore. James struggled with the other man to keep the iron plate still while another welded it. He knew the welds would break if they were moved before cooling sufficiently to harden in place. His eyes traveled down to the deck at his feet. He could see through a gap between the deck and the outer hull to the deck below where other men were also putting plates on this seam. How far down did the tear go, he wondered. The welder finished along one side and pushed James over so he could continue the weld along the top of the plate and down the other side. He stepped back to watch, wondering what else he could do. The ship was heaving violently up and down as it rode the waves. Every so often he could feel it pitch sharply to one side or the other, making it difficult to keep his balance. The welder completed his patch and turned to grab his welding kit. Unplug the welder from that box, the welder pointed to a gray disconnect on the wall down the corridor. But throw that lever down first or you could be electrocuted. James hurried to the gray box, grabbing the red handle. He pulled it down and saw the red light go out. He twisted the plug and released it and began coiling the cable over his arm as he made his way back to the welder. Come on, bring that cable with you, the welder said and handed him the other end of the cable. Then he turned to head up on the deck to close the tear there. They moved quickly to the companionway and ascended to the deck. Stepping out of the hatch, James found himself in darkness with sea spray stinging his face again. He paused momentarily to allow his eyes to adjust and followed the welder forward toward the port side foredeck. As the third man laid a strip of steel across the broken seam on the deck, the welder plugged in his welder and directed James to plug the other end of the cable into a deck service disconnect near the bow. He quickly unrolled the cable and stretched it to the outlet. Plugging it in, he twisted to lock it in, turned on the disconnect, and went back to the other men. With nothing more to do until the welding was complete, he took a moment to look out at the storm. Waves rolled by higher than the ship and lightning cracked the night like a whip, revealing froth blowing from the tops of the waves. The ship continued to rise and fall as it rode the waves, rolling occasionally to each side. Almost finished, the welder said, and James took this as his cue to be ready to retrieve the cable. He went to the disconnect to stand by. Holding onto the foredeck railing to keep his balance, James looked up at the bridge and saw the captain looking down, observing their work. His face showed none of the consternation he knew the man surely felt, but rather he seemed happy. As if everything happening right now was all he expected. Then the lights went out and the captain's face disappeared in the darkness as the telltale sound of the engines shutting down reverberated through the ship. The welder looked up, lifting his hood, and the look on his face made James feel suddenly very uneasy. 
The ship was now without power and at the mercy of the storm until they got it going again. Come on, the welder yelled and ran for the interior of the ship, leaving his gear lay. James followed, and as they neared the hatch, he turned to see what the terrible noise behind him was. Lightning flashed as he looked up to see a wave towering over the bow of the ship. At the top, foam boiled like teeth as the crest of the wave folded over like a gaping maw intent on swallowing the ship. He had been unable to imagine a wave as high as the ship was long, but now he didn't have to imagine. Knowing he would be washed from the deck if he wasn't secure, James lunged for the nearest thing he saw to hang on to. It was one of the ship's life rings and it was strapped securely to the bulkhead. He lifted it and slipped it over his arms and head, hugging it to his chest. As the wave crashed down on the ship, he took a deep breath and held it to wait for the water to pass. The water hit him much harder than he could have ever imagined it was possible, knocking the air from his lungs and slamming him against the bulkhead. He blacked out. The sound of seagulls woke him and James looked groggily around. The sun was high in the sky and the water was calm. I guess old Ben was right about the storm running from the light, he thought to himself. Untangling ropes around him, he realized he was floating in the life ring and the ship was nowhere in sight. What had happened to the ship? Had he been washed overboard? Or had the ship sunk from under him after he was knocked unconscious? As far as he could see, there was nothing in sight except endless water. Even bobbing higher on the gentle swell revealed nothing. He tried to remember where they were on the ocean when he last looked at the charts. They had been heading southwest since leaving the Hawaiian Islands toward a small island near Fiji. Though they were very spread apart, the ocean was littered with small islands all around this area. He noted the position of the sun and watched a shadow on the life ring. As it moved, he was able to tell east from west. Knowing this, he was able to determine north and south and realize he was facing northeast. He should be continuing toward the southwest, as that is where they would likely find an island. If he survived long enough, that is. He had no water, nor rations. The best he could hope for until he found land was to possibly catch some small fish for sustenance. Pushing the negative thoughts from his mind, he moved his arms in the water to orient himself toward the southwest. As he turned, he got a surprise. He was no more than a half a mile from an island, and he could see spray rising up from the breakers. He leaned forward and began to slowly kick his legs to propel himself toward the island. Using his hands as rudders, he altered his course as needed in order to reach the island where the water looked calm. He hoped there was a beach there, as he wasn't sure he could manage to climb rocks. Coming closer to the island where the water was calm, he found sheer cliffs of volcanic rock. He scanned the shores to either side until he found an opening in the rocks. He would try there. Slowly he advanced until he could see there was an opening in the rocks that led into a small lagoon. Now he was getting excited. He would have a chance to find some water, or maybe coconuts, which with to quench the thirst raging in his throat. With a final burst of energy, he pushed forward around the rocks and into the lagoon where he suddenly stopped, unable to conceive what he was seeing. James stared in disbelief at the shores of the small lagoon, which were lined with the pinnacle of seagoing man's fantasies. Beautiful women with bronze skin and long flowing hair lifted their faces and bare chests to the sun. He had sailed the shores of Europe, and sunbathing nude women was not anything new. The cause for his disbelief was their lower bodies. They were mermaids. There were about twelve of them laying along the edge of the water all around him. As he looked at each one, he smiled and gave a little wave to show he was not unfriendly. All of them responded with curious looks, and a couple waved gently back, but none of them smiled. Was it because they were wary? He picked a spot on the beach which was furthest from the mermaids on either side and slowly kicked toward the beach until he could stand and walk. Carrying the life ring with him, he collapsed on the sand, happy to be ashore. He heard a couple of splashes and looked up to see several of the mermaids had entered the lagoon and were heading toward him. As they reached the beach, they pulled themselves onto the sand with strong arms and rested a few feet away from him. Unsure what to say or even think, 
He merely smiled and nodded at them. A couple of them giggled and made light chirping noises to each other. Then a third made a bit of a different chirping with a few squeaks and all the others began to giggle. Obviously, he had no idea if this is how they communicated to each other, but he found it amusing at the very least. Then, one of them spoke up in a soft voice. Did the storm take your ship, sailor? she asked. Y y yes he finally managed. I was knocked out cold and woke up to find myself floating in the sea. Oh, that's terrible, one of the others chimed in. How long were you out there? I'm not sure, he looked to the sun, which was climbing high overhead now. It was dark, and when I woke, it was mid-morning. I think it must have taken me a couple hours to paddle here once I saw the island. You must be hungry, another said. Let us bring you food and some fresh cold water, the first one said emphatically. Being in the salt water makes one terribly thirsty. Thank you, James said, wondering what food they would bring. He wasn't sure he could bring himself to eat raw fish when he was on land and could make a fire, but he didn't want to offend them. He watched three of them turn and re-enter the water, swimming out of the lagoon. He was sure they would bring back fish since they were going out to sea. Looking around, he saw there was plenty of driftwood along the tree line around the lagoon. If they brought fish, he would just have to cook it first. Looking at the mermaids around him, James could not believe his fortune in finally fulfilling a dream he'd had since he was a boy. But somewhere in the back of his mind, he also could not forget the stern warning Ben had given him the night before. He found nothing nasty about any of them, in fact, found them quite enchanting. He did, though, have to consciously work to keep from staring at their beautiful bare bodies. Looking at their lower bodies, he found they were not really scaly at all, but instead smooth-skinned like a catfish. Down the center of their tails on the front and rear was a line of scales, but even these looked soft and not like the hard bony scales of a fish their size. No two of them had the same coloration of their tails, but they were common in that their colors faded from darker and lighter shades of the color they were in a magnificent array. Some were silver and gray, while others were varying shades of greens, reds, blues, and even one who was purple. The purple one seemed most interested in him, and had moved closer to be able to touch him. She gently caressed his arms, shoulders, and chest, brushing the sand away and soothing the itch created by the salt water as it dried. The three who had gone for food arrived back at the mouth of the lagoon, pushing a small raft piled high with tropical fruits and coconuts. He also saw a boda bag, answering the question of how they would bring water. As they pushed the raft to the beach where he sat, the others from around the lagoon began to leave their positions and gather around him. They formed a line from the raft to the group and began handing the food and drink to one another until it was piled all around him. James knew there was no way he could eat and drink all that was brought, but was grateful for their generosity nonetheless. Then came a rush of mixed emotions as they began to eat while offering some to him. He was embarrassed at thinking it was all for him, and at the same time honored, as it seemed he was a guest joining them for a meal. He smiled broadly as the purple one sitting closest to him, whom he'd begun to think of as Violet, drank from a bag of water and then offered it to him. Then she bit from a very juicy piece of fruit and held it out for him to eat from. When he bit into it, he heard the others begin to giggle and looked around to see sparkling eyes peering at him over the food they ate. This continued on until they had all eaten their fill and laid back in the cool evening light to rest. Violet lay closely next to him, resting her head on his upper arm. He couldn't remember the last time a girl wanted to be close to him and dozed off with a full belly and happy heart. His last thought before drifting off to sleep was of the ship and the men thereon. Had the ship survived and he was merely lost at sea, or was he the only survivor? James woke to the feeling of a hand rubbing his chest. He remained still for a moment looking up at the stars, enjoying the feeling. Though it was night, he could see fairly well and turned his head to look around. The other mermaids had all spread out again around the lagoon. Only Violet remained near him lying close and absently rubbing his chest. Her warm breath blew on his neck each time she breathed, sending pleasurable waves across his skin. 
Removing his hand from under his head, he rotated his arm down and wrapped it across her shoulders, pulling her closer as his hand rested on her breast. She snuggled up and turned her body so his hand rested fully on her breast, and he cupped it, marveling that it was so soft. He felt her nipple stiffen under his palm and wondered if she too found this arousing. His answer came quickly as she began to kiss his neck and chest lightly. Her tail rubbed against his legs, and to his surprise, his knee seemed to slip into her tail as if between two thighs. He was insanely curious how this could be, while at the same time felt a growing need to have her. She reached over and pulled him atop of her as she rolled onto her back. He was surprised when his knees felt the sand and her tail on either side of his legs. Letting go of his curiosity, James lost himself in her. A loud splash pulled him from a pleasant dream and James rolled over to see the sun was already peeking over the rocks to the east. Violet was in the middle of the lagoon with the others where they all swam and splashed. It seemed as though they were playing like carefree children, just happy to be alive. He grasped that thought. Yes, he was happy to be alive and watching them, which was good enough. One of them saw he was awake and waved for him to come and join them. He had never been much of one to play in the water, but felt he should at least wash after spending the last 18 hours lying on the ground. He propped himself up on an elbow and grabbed one of the bags of water lying nearby. Tipping it back, he drank deeply, relishing the cool, clean taste, and splashed a little on his face. The water tasted amazing. Feeling refreshed, he turned his attention back to the mermaids. They seemed to be having a lot of fun, and though he could hear happy chirps mixed with actual laughter, none of them were smiling openly. The expressions on their mouths were happy, but they never once bared teeth in a smile. It made him wonder why. He was motioned in again, and this time rose to his feet and entered the water. Immediately they swam toward him, encircling him like a bunch of sharks. After one or two turns, they would swim off again rapidly before turning to come back once more. They were able to swim very fast. Standing in shoulder-deep water, he bent his knees and submerged fully, running his fingers through his hair to wash it. He took a few minutes to gently scrub his whole body, feeling the dirt fall away. When he surfaced once again, Violet was right there in front of him, saying, Good morning. Startled, he smiled and looked into her eyes. Good morning to you. Did you sleep well? she asked, coming closer and putting her hands on his chest. I didn't disturb you, did I? Disturb him, he thought. He had made love to a mermaid on the shore of a tropical lagoon under the stars. No, of course not, he said matter-of-fact. That was one of the best nights I ever had. A warm glow seemed to rise on her face. I'm glad, she said and let one hand slip beneath the water to caress him. She turned to look at the others and made a few chirping sounds. In unison, they turned and swam away from the lagoon, leaving them alone. Where are they going? James asked, reaching his arms around to pull her close. They're going to prepare a feast for us to enjoy. We'll join them in a little while, she said and pressed closer against him. Once again, James found himself entangled with his mermaid lover as she wrapped her lower body around him. They floated lazily together for a few minutes until he felt his back coming to rest on the beach at the edge of the water. She rolled under him, kissing his neck and chest as he propped himself on his hands above her. For a short while, they were lost in each other and James could not fathom the intensity that they shared. At some points, he worried he may hurt her, but she met him in return. When it was over, he rolled to the side, panting. He looked down to see just how they had been able to come together, and found that her tail was split from her hips, down along the lines of scales he had first noticed. Inside, her skin looked very much human, and even her lady parts looked normal. The only difference between her and a woman that he could see was the lack of evident knees and feet. He watched as the two halves of her tail came together, and the scale line interlinked to lock the halves together as one appendage. They rested together for a short while before she pushed herself backwards into the water and beckoned him to follow. He complied and swam to the opening of the lagoon with her where she took his hand. Where we're going can only be accessed underwater. 
I can breathe underwater because of my gills. She turned her head and pointed to her neck behind her ears, making him wonder how he hadn't noticed before. If you feel you can no longer hold your breath, squeeze my hand and I'll stop and breathe for you. Just exhale through your mouth and when I press my lips to yours, you can breathe in. Don't be afraid. I'm not afraid, James said, and found he was not indeed. They took a deep breath and she plunged them under the water. Her tail moved gracefully and James found himself amazed at how fast she was dragging him through the water. He looked at the ocean around him, marveling at the sight, until he began to feel lightheaded and realized he needed to breathe. He squeezed her hand and watched as she turned toward him, pulling him close. As their faces met, he exhaled, losing sight of her in the bubbles, and then was able to breathe in when he felt her lips press to his. Without waiting, she turned and was off again. A few moments later they entered a cave, stopping briefly so he could get a breath, and then plunged onward. The light faded and he wondered how she could see. Then he heard what sounded like tones ringing in the water and realized she was using echolocation much like dolphins do to find her way. They stopped once more for a breath and then he began to see light as they emerged from the tunnel into another lagoon. Floating on the surface, breathing normally, James looked around. They were in a long, dead, volcanic crater which was flooded. All around him were small islands with waterways twisting between them to the outside walls, which stretched several hundred feet vertically to the rim. Sunlight shone in at an angle, lighting one side, and he could see sparkles of crystals in the wall. He realized that as the sun passed over through the course of the day, the light would shine across the lagoon from one side to the other until it crawled up the other wall in the evening until it disappeared at the rim. She turned, still holding his hand, and pulled him across the water to a small waterfall which cascaded from an opening high in the wall into the lagoon. They climbed on a rock under the waterfall and James realized the water was fresh. This must be where they filled the bags of water. He drank deeply and rubbed his hands all over to rinse the salt from his skin. The water was almost warm, but it still tasted refreshingly cool. Sitting on the rock with Violet leaning against him, he held her in his arms and looked around the cavern. On many of the small islands grew a variety of fruit trees and vegetable plants. Lying close to the trees on these islands were several sticks with a Y shape at one end. He wondered what these were for until he saw one of the other mermaids surface next to a small island. She grabbed one of the sticks and used it to knock fruit from the tree. Gathering the fruit, she disappeared under the water, only to reappear across the cavern at a larger bare island where all of them were placing fruits and vegetables. He realized this must be the feast Violet spoke of. "'Can I ask you something?' James asked quietly. "'Yes, of course,' she replied. "'What would you like to know?' "'I noticed that there are no mermen here with you,' James began. "'In my studies... I learned that long ago mermaids were hunted by the Vikings because they were eaters of men. Then, when a small group of mermaids escaped, they changed their ways to helping men. Is this true? Oh yes, she replied emphatically. Mermaids are descended from the sirens of old, and they were malicious eaters of men. Their song would drive men mad, making them crash their ships on rocks so they could partake of human flesh. When mermaids evolved from them, they still craved the flesh of men, but it was the mermen who hunted men. After being hunted, mermaids forbade the hunting of men, but the mermen refused to follow. Lest we be hunted again, mermaids do not suffer a male child to live. James was pleased to know that he had learned correctly. He was unaware that the males were killed at birth, but it made sense. Even if mated with a human, there were sure to be male offspring occasionally. I've also noticed that all of you appear very young. Are there any old mermaids? he asked. She looked at him with a sparkling eyes. Obviously, something he had said pleased her. Well, I am the youngest here, but I'm 212 years old. I think the oldest of us is her. She pointed to the gray mermaid on the other island. She's about 400 years old and nearing her end. James was astounded. 
He would have said that Violet was no more than 20 years old, and the one she pointed to seemed about 40. When we feel the end coming, we leave our home and swim to the deep, she said looking at the other mermaid. Once there, we make cuts to our body to bleed and attract sharks. This is a relatively painless end and makes sure there is no body for men to find, keeping us hidden. James found his questions of why mermaids were never seen answered. Thinking about it, he couldn't blame them. Men loved to hunt, and given a justification such as hunting man-eaters, they would gladly slaughter all they found. All of the others were gathered where the food was piled, and James found he was hungry. Seeming to sense it was time, Violet slid into the water and waited for him to join her. Together, they made their way across to the others. Once they were all together, no one wasted any time starting to eat. Swallowing the last handful of grapes, James eyed a sweet-looking melon and tried to decide whether or not to have some. His thoughts were interrupted by a sudden excited chirping among the mermaids. He looked to Violet for a clue as to what was happening and saw she was very excited. As if on cue, all of the mermaids moved away from the rock and slipped under the water. Violet also slipped into the water and then turned to take James' hand, leading him across the lagoon toward the waterfall. As they approached, she instructed him to take a deep breath before diving down and entering a cave hidden beneath the froth and boiling of the water. This cave was much shorter than the first, and as they near the end, he saw that the light here was much brighter than in the big cavern. Had they gone outside? If so, why had they not entered this way? Exiting the cave, James saw the room here was much smaller than the cavern. As they began to ascend to the surface, he looked down and saw the floor here was littered with bones. Many of them were the skeletons of very small mermaids. He realized these must be the skeletons of the mermen born to these mermaids. They broke the surface next to a small island, and James climbed onto it with Violet. He looked around. This room was very small and lighted by a large crack in the ceiling. A single bright sunbeam traveled from the crack and penetrated the water next to the island, causing the room to glow. The other mermaids all surrounded the rock they were on, and for a brief moment, James felt like he was on a sacrificial altar. Thank you, James, Violet said, moving closer to him. I have the new life you gave me growing in my belly now. I could sense the changes in my body while we were eating. Soon, I will give birth. That's great, James said, smiling. How long does a mermaid pregnancy last? When will I be able to see my child? For a brief moment, Violet's face became very sad, and he wondered why. A vision of the bones he saw on the floor below flashed in his mind, and some of them had been human. He could not recall seeing any mermaid tails on the adult-sized skeletons. He looked over the side and down into the glowing water. The adult skeletons he could see all had legs and feet. Then it occurred to him that mermaids could not suffer a male to live. But he wasn't a merman, he was human. He looked to Violet with full realization in his eyes and another of his questions was answered as he looked at all the mermaids around him. They were all smiling and the sight filled him with terror. Their lips stretched overly wide for a human smile and all of them had mouths full of razor-sharp teeth like a shark or a piranha. Violet leaned forward to kiss him gently, and then kissed his neck. As her teeth sunk into him, tearing his throat out, a thought came to him through the fog of pain. Old Ben was right again. <laughs> well, what'd y'all think about that one? Yeah, I spent a lot of time on the ocean. I've never seen a mermaid. Don't know that I want to. All right, y'all. I hope you enjoyed that. I'll be back next Friday with another tale. And we'll get back to it. Until then, sleep well. <laughs>